Welcome listeners to the Speaking From Our Hearts podcast episode where I'm joined today by Paul Luftenegger and Paul is a, and I'm going to read my notes here, Paul is an international, brackets Canadian, multi-award winning singer-songwriter and composer, inspiring and promoting global love and kindness through a portfolio of positive, conscious songs. Wow, Paul, <laughs> well, welcome. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me, Paul. I'm so grateful to be here. Okay, so where do we start with that uh, that intro? Um, okay, so tell tell us about a bit about yourself, Paul. Let's have a nice sort of gentle um, foray in, into the into the uh, conversation and uh, find out a bit about you. So tell us. Sure. Well, first of all, I just want to say thank you to anyone that's tuning in to this uh, for coming. I always like to thank everyone that sort of takes time. So thank you for taking time if you're listening to this. Um, I send you love, peace, joy, happiness, and prosperity. Um, so the long story short sort of uh, about me, I'll just share that I'm 42 years old. Um, I think that's a good starting off point. So I've been around long enough to know a few things, <laughs> um, but I'm still learning lots. Um, and I think you know what I learn more as I get older is that there's lots to learn in, uh, in life. And I think that when you learn or when you're open to being a student to life, I think it opens up so many opportunities to experience uh, the gamut of what it means to truly be human. So if you're, you know, if you're in a, if you're listening to this, I'm, I'm assuming you're likely coming to this because you're seeking something, um, which means you're, you're actually a student. So I think we're all students together. So I like to just start off with the fact that we're all equals. Um, I've been, you know, I've been through quite a bit in my life. I'm gay. Um, I like to always sort of say that I had to take off that first mask <laughs> in my youth, um, which prepared me to take off many more masks in my life. Um, being gay was much easier than taking off the mask of being spiritual um, for me. And, um, you know, I've always been that kid, um, even now, where I was interested in the psychic spectrum or the medium spectrum. Um, and I've always felt called to, to service with God or source, uh, the universe, whatever word you use. Uh, mm -hmm. But I've always been with God um, from the time I can remember. And I sort of repressed this when I was a child a lot because I was confused by it being Catholic. Um, but what's sort of interesting is in uh, basically 2011, my father sadly took his own life. And it put me into a tailspin of um, having to sort of lean on God like I've never had to. And um, ultimately, I was 34 years old when that happened, and uh, my life sort of blew up, and I could no longer be who I used to be. It was like I actually had died in many ways because I had to rebirth myself into, I think, just a new space. And um, kind of the, the, the interesting part of all of this is that I was in music pretty much my whole life, and I was sort of that kid that everybody noticed could sing. I sang for the Pope when I was 15 into 16 years old. Um, you know, I had a lot of musical sort of lifetime space when I was a kid. And um, I sort of repressed that the older I got because I didn't think I could have a career making music and making money as I was told and programmed for many people. Um, not my parents, but the world. Mm -hmm. um, so that being said, I sort of believed that I couldn't, I couldn't be a musician and have you know, money, essentially. So I went down the corporate path. Um, I worked for Hewlett Packard. I worked for call centers. I did emergency roadside services as a manager for pretty much every major car company. Um, and when my father died, I just couldn't do any of that anymore. And I started doing music for the first time publicly in 2011. And I was called by God to do this. Um, so that's really sort of, you know, the overview, very quick overview of a lot of stuff that went on in my life. But um, in 2011, I sort of uh, started this new part of me, which is um, essentially being an international singer and songwriter. And I write music to inspire global love and kindness from within. And, uh, you know, I've sang for the UN three times. And, you know, I won't go on with all of that. But it's, you know, I have definitely, um, something's happening in the world with my music. Let's just say that. Yeah. 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 What, what age, Paul, was you, was you aware of this? Um, probably at that age, I don't know if talent was the right word at that age, but this this inspiration, this feeling inside, this this way of being of you and and this relationship with music. Mm. What 
Yeah, it, it sort of happened really for as long as I can remember. So my granny, um, who took care of me um, in this little pocket of time when I was a kid, um, and it's really interesting because we have a lot of uh, grandchildren in our family. And for exactly when I was born, it was this little tiny spot where my granny was around to take care mm -hmm. of me. And she was a singer. Um, and I believe everything's in divine order. Um, there's no mistake that this happened for me at that time. And uh, she always knew I was a singer. So she just started singing with me and playing the piano with me, the organ. And I just fell in love with music. I just, I loved it. Um, I loved how it lit people up when she sang. And the thing that's sort of interesting when I look back at it, I could never be who I am without my mother or her, who mm -hmm. basically brought music into my life um, at a really young age. So um, our whole sort of side of my mom's side, all the sisters used to all sing together with their mother in, you know, in four and five part harmonies. And it was just a really beautiful, I had really strong women um, singers in my life. And it was sort of a cool, I grew up in the, you know, the late 70s and the 80s, and it was a beautiful time on the earth <laughs> where I think you know, it was a very different world than today. Um, but I'm, mm -hmm. I'm so grateful for sort of the musical sort of nourishment that I had. 70s, I've just made a note of that, Paul. I'm, I'm right, okay, 70s music. Let, let's have a little bit of a dive into that because, yeah. um, I mean, I was born in 1960, so I'm a, I'm a little bit older. So, um, you know, 60s, I can remember, it's interesting what you're saying around the kind of matriarchal uh, influence there, Paul, because I was brought up by my grandmother uh, and my mother. Mm -hmm. um, never really had any positive role models in my life but i can remember him saying to me at a very early age particularly my grandmother ah oh, paul one day you will be a famous footballer or a famous music man she used to call it music man <laughs> and well okay i've ended up neither but <laughs> this time you know let's let's uh, the clock's the clock's still sort of ticking away yeah <laughs> But I can remember, Paul, um, at the age of three, 1963 to be precise, mm. Millie singing My Boy Lollipop. Wow. <laughs> and it absolutely, it just took over me. Right. And that's my earliest memory of this thing called music. And I was it Wayne Dyer that says, don't die with your music still inside you. Yeah, exactly. And I love that you brought that up because that's a really important part of, I think, um, I think music has been really misunderstood and I feel sort of like I'm an ambassador yeah. to get us back on track with some of this stuff actually for the divine. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, I think what you share there, uh, Paul, is perfect because, you know, we need to become responsible as a world for also making sure that we support musicians and music. And yeah. I love Britain in particular, you know, I've lived in London, England. Um, and what I love about London that I really noticed um, is that the arts are supported very differently than in you know, most of the other parts of the world. And I love that Brit Britain in particular, British people honor the arts in a very different way than I think anywhere else I've ever been actually. Um, and I think it's important to sort of remember that we have to realize the power of music uniting people together. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, from a, from a perspective of just even financial, you know, if you look at the music industry, when Apple Music sort of came out, what's interesting about music is that really the cost or the price of music to purchase it has gone down to almost to the point of it being pathetic. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, we need to become responsible consumers of what, you know, for a long time, people used to just steal music. Yeah. And I say, this with, I say this with respect because, you know, I've been, you know, I, I use some of those services too, so I don't want to sort of point any fingers. Mm -hmm. But I do, you know, being on this side of music and seeing pennies come in at times for what people listen to, and oftentimes people saying that they can't afford an album. I can't count how many times I've been told that. Mm -hmm. Well, what I can't imagine is a world without music or musicians to lift the spirit of humanity up. And I think we as a community need to start being accountable for where we spend our money. And I think music's one of those things where we need to make sure that we A, keep it in the schools, and B, make sure that we support artists and especially new artists so that we keep the industry of music thriving like never before. Because it's the one thing that actually is a very unique energy to bring people together in peace. And it, you know, it has no borders, it has no 
lines that divide. It is actually something that unites. Um, and it uses the left and the right hemisphere of the brain. There's so much study happening about this. And I say this, you know, you opened sort of a, a little nerve for me when you, when you shared that. So thank you. Um, and it gave me an opportunity to share just sort of my belief on why you had that feeling when you were a kid. And I think we need to remember that kids need us as, you know, adults and parents to make sure we introduce, you know, music that has some actual, you know, value uh, in, in the lyrics, in the content, and also to the mu musician singing. And I think we have really, you know, at times we have sort of some, some singers that are sort of uh, not doing a very good job of being leaders for the future. So no names, but, you know, to be conscious of what you introduce your children to in music. Absolutely. Yeah. From from your earliest recollections, Paul, who were the who were the most influential musicians in uh, in your life? Obviously, uh, as somebody growing up that have got this this feeling, this expression, this love, call it what you will, this whole thing bubbling inside. But who yeah. really kind of, if there was one or many, who who were those influences? Well, I love this question, and not it's really interesting. I've done a lot of interviews uh, since I started doing this work, and not a lot of people ask me this, which I love this question. Um, so for me, I first of all love all kinds of music. Um, I love classical for various reasons. Um, I'm a piano player, so I, I grew up with classical piano. So I love Bach, Beethoven. I love Beethoven with all my heart, probably my famous, famous favorite pianist that way. Um, in music, in terms of, you know, more into the modern world, let's call it. Um, I loved growing up with the Beatles. I think actually John Lennon and his work um, is without question some of the most important um, questions asked in music. Um, do I think he was a perfect, you know, guy? No, I don't, but no one is. But as a musician, I really do honor his, um, his consciousness in music, especially the latter part when he left the Beatles with Yoko Ono. Yeah. Um, I also love, you know, I love the big bands. Like I love Coldplay with all my heart. I love U2 um, so much. Um, and I love some country as well. And I think just, you know, a balancing out of, um, of all styles is so important. So I also love, you know, as I've gotten older, I love jazz a lot just because it offers sort of that sort of um, uh, ad hoc kind of playing, um, just, you know, without sort of the, the structure, without it being, you know, <laughs> grid-like. Um, and I love, the other thing too is I love black musicians. I grew up also with the, uh, the thing that I was obsessed with as a kid was We Are the World. I was obsessed with, um, you know, basically Celine Dion. I loved, um, the other person that I loved was Whitney Houston as a kid. Um, I loved, uh, there's so many from that, from that sort of timeline. Leonard Cohen's amazing, you know. So many, too many to mention. I love all of it. <laughs> Very acquired taste, but yeah, I share that. Uh, I share that focus, Paul. When you were speaking there, there was a couple of things that flashed through my mind around uh, when you was talking about the Beatles and one particular uh, lyric: "Money can't buy you love, can't yeah. buy me love." Yeah. And that amalgamated to my, well, one of my favourite all times is when Shirley Bassey sings, "This is my life." Mm. I have such a lot of love. Yeah. I want to give. Let me live. Let me live. And what she's saying is like, whatever's gone in the past, who really gives a damn? Because I'm yeah. here. And I'm here to love. And I just think there's this whole kind of contrast and dichotomy, Paul, between what the world sees as money and this kind of, I call them silver trinkets, out there. You know, you've got to have, you've got to have stuff. Mm -hmm. And this contrasting inner world of, no, you haven't. You've got to have art. Yeah. And I kind of use those two examples, Paul, just picking up on your thread there of this whole movement, this love revolution now that I believe is sweeping this earth. There's a radical, the winds of, to quote Bob Dylan, the winds of change, they are a blowing. Yeah, that's a good, that's a darn good quote to use right now for the times that we're in. And they are blowing strong. And yeah. you either, the thing that I think is sort of interesting is I, I don't think a lot of people actually realize what's going on, actually. Mm. Um, and it's sort of interesting. I, I think right now there's actually two worlds going on. Yeah. Um, there's the conscious world, yeah. which is, you know, people that are aware of, you know, what they're doing, taking responsibility for it, you know, in the communities that we sort of circle, uh, the new age more so communities. 
But mm -hmm. there's also this unconscious world still that's, you know, we call it 3D in our world and 5D sometimes. I don't know if you've heard those terms. Yeah. But it's interesting because what's happening, that sweep of wind coming in, that love evolution or revolution. I like the word evolution because we're evolving. Um, mm -hmm. And I think what's happening is humanity is growing up and starting to take some responsibility for what we're creating and mm -hmm. co-creating. So I love that you said that because it's darn true in my world. And when you, when you seek into the conscious world, there's so much blooming right now. And it's exciting. Yeah, it is. You know, one of the core, one of the dialogues I have, well, more consistently than ever now, Paul, is, you know, obviously through speaking from a hearts podcast, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm in contact with so many amazing people around the globe and yeah. invariably, you know, that C word consciousness gets raised and, you know, some of the people on the depth and the, you know, the level, you know, you talk about the level five, for example, um, and those shares and, and what I've, what I'm sort of on a submission because there is a bit far bigger mission, but one of the submissions I believe Paul is to take that, power of consciousness mm -hmm. and the benefits thereof and i'm particularly influenced by rupert sparanin's non-duality philosophy but mm -hmm. take that out onto the streets where it's dark yeah it's a good and communicate with words in a language that people understand not an elevated fluffy or what's perceived to be fluffy and i use you know other people's words not mine i paraphrase there because that power needs to be taken out onto the streets to to shed some light on that darkness. Yeah, and it's, you know, it's a confusing thing to sort of um, figure out how to, um, I think, you know, most effectively help others. Um, mm -hmm. So I, you know, I think that's, I think really where, where we're at is, in our, it really comes back to community grassroots, those basic community sort of opportunities, let's call them, to expand or amplify, um, I think just, ultimately non-confrontational, um, I think ultimately respect. And this is why when I started, you know, sharing today, like, you know, being gay, it's very interesting because, you know, I've had every kind of experience dealing with, you know, I've been literally kicked out of um, a country where my husband's from to the point of them now accepting me legally um, as a spouse. So it's very interesting to see sort of in my lifetime where I've seen things go, you know, we're in a time of great change um, from a human rights perspective um, alone. So I think accessing what we've learned and making sure that, you know, we do action and service, you know, service to others um, is really where we actually end up serving ourselves. This is what I've learned in my life, mm -hmm. one of the mm -hmm. big things. So I think what you're sharing is really just where we, you know, we always think that we can't really affect change. And if I can do, I mean, I've been invited to the UN three times. If I can get invited to the UN, I can guarantee you, we can certainly do things that, like I never thought that that was really gonna ever happen for me, truthfully. Um, and you know, it's interesting because once you start sort of helping others, others start helping you. Yeah. And I think this is the thing that you're talking about. And we all need to sort of become a little bit more um, aware that we can actually go and help, help people. And if you help one person, I remember when I started doing what I do, I thought, you know, if I help one person not take their, their own life, I've helped enough that it matters that, you know, if, if I save one life um, because of what I do, that's great. And I can guarantee you with the letters and messages I've received sharing my story publicly and openly about my father's suicide, um, I know that I've, I've helped, I couldn't count the many, many, many thousands of people now. And I think this is what you're talking about. So through service, is how we do what you're talking about. And I think I'd like to inspire anyone to just sort of, you know, brush off the past and go and help somebody else that needs a little something. And it doesn't always have to be money. It can be, you know, it can be just, a, just to listen is to love. Um, and I think, you know, the basic human sort of things that we forget about, um, you know, sometimes even just someone that's old in an elderly care facility, just listening to someone share because they're lonely um, is a beautiful gift that you can give someone. Um, so those are the kinds of things that I think are really scalable. Yeah, interesting. Paul, listening to you mention suicide, that was something that um, I'd like to share this as well with you. That at thirteen and a half, um, because of the uh, 
barbaric, grotesque, um, and I'm being polite there for the uh, sensitivity of the listeners, treatment of my stepfather that I actually uh, come very close to. And my awareness of service, to use your word, became apparent. I mean, I couldn't intellectualise it. I couldn't rationalise it because I was, I was a child um, in, in years. And certainly emotionally, I, my head was screwed completely by this barbaric behaviour that I'd been on the end of, which turned me to drink at a very early age. It turned me to violence at a very early age. And that was my life. But what I've understood... And so I can tell the story at the cold face of life, up dark alleyways where, you know, things happen. Yeah. Scars over my body to prove it. Right. But it's a question of choice, Paul, isn't it? And the power to say to people, and I don't think it's oversimplifying it to say, look, guys, you've got a choice between fear and love. Yeah, it's always that. It's always the root of everything. Yeah. You know, and, you know, I mean, I know in the UK at the moment there's horrific knife crime um, between young people, amongst young people, um, youngsters losing their life daily. And I understand that because that was very much the culture I was, that fear, get in first, win at all costs, you know, yeah. lash out for then ask questions later and all this kind of craziness. It was all born yeah. out of fear. And I like what you referred to, Paul, if we can just go back a bit about the mask at the top of this conversation, you know, mm-hmm. when you introduced us uh, to the early parts of your journey and you gave two scenarios, one around your sexuality and the other one around your spirituality. Mm-hmm. And I'd like to come to the second one uh, of the spirituality, if I can, please, because I, and it's only my personal view, but I'm interested in your thoughts around this. Mm-hmm. You know, I've, I've got a partner, I've been with her 10 years beautiful soul but we openly discuss that our most in, intimate relationship is with our source yeah that is yeah. because without that we're just kind of we're just shallow sort of human beings if you will 100 percent. and so you you bringing this into focus again which i love i love this conversation and i'm very very well with my soul to talk about this because I think that we need to be mature enough to start talking about some of the things that go on on the inside. So this is the, this is the real, this is the real shift here. And you know, if you dig in to the spiritual movement that's going on is there's this thing that until you sort of go through something that's pretty real, um, you don't really, you don't really have an understanding of what really what life stems from and the reality is is that i remember watching this this yogi um actually throw a ball into an audience from a stage and the person caught one person caught it in their hand and he asked you know where did you experience catching the ball and the person in the audience was well in my hand and he's like well yes but where did you feel it where did you experience it or where was it you know where was it where was the sensation and the person was like, well, you know, on my fingertips and in my, and the, and then he said, well, yes, but you know, where did you actually feel and catch the ball from? How did you know to catch it? And the answer was like, well, I guess it came kind of from the inside. And so this is sort of the big thing in the world that I think hasn't really been taught to us very well is that we live life actually on the inside. And until you sort of realize that you really can't understand source all that well. Mm. And I think, you know, to those To those that sort of go, oh, I'm an atheist or, you know, and all the power to you, what you believe, it's cool, I'm well with it. But at the end of the day, if you think you're alone in this infinite space, (laughs) I just, I don't know how you can look at endless stars and sky and think that there's not a, a conscious intelligence that's sort of part of all of it. I don't think that it's a, you know, a domination force at all. I think it's a beautiful opportunity source where we, we can become one with that energy that sustains our life. And um, I think you know, the spiritual maturity that we have to have is realize that we're not large enough or big enough to do this life alone. And mm-hmm. until you sort of deal with that, you really have a misunderstanding of what's going on because there's an energy that flows through the core of us. Yeah. And I think what I've realized in my, um, in my life is I've had to learn that myself and I needed to do that after my dad died because I was, I was, 
broken and very hurt um, in a way that I've never, I've never sustained a blow like that in my life. And I knew I couldn't do it alone anymore. And I needed to lean on God. Um, and I didn't actually care about the world for the first time in my life. I used to live in great fear. Um, and I just, I just, it was a survival moment where I had to sort of literally let go of the world and just be with God. And I was actually, and I still am, but it's been eight years uh, since then. And it's very interesting because when somebody dies and you go through trauma, something happens. Um, and there's this sort of uh, angelic space that happens that I never anticipated is there. And you can tap into it from the inside. And I think what's interesting is I thought that when you know my father would die or my mother would die, that the relationship would just be over. But I forgot in my silly human mind that the relationship carries on and becomes spiritual. Mm -hmm. And my father and I have a very spiritual relationship now that I never thought would be an option. And I, I didn't, couldn't think of it this way before I knew. So the soul goes on and there's still a, a telepathy, if you will, that can happen between us once someone leaves the physical body. And it's very interesting to me because that part of life has to come from the inside. And that's part of source um, as well. You know, I say God, you know, but source, you know, everything's returning to its source. And this is the part that's very cool. Just like a water drop and an ocean, it came from the ocean and it's always seeking to go back to yeah. the big yeah. pool. <laughs> so I look at, at God sort of that way. And the reality is, is it's a co-creative world and universe. Um, so we're co-creating with the divine. Absolutely. I share that 100%. Yeah. Loving conscious music, Paul, what does that term mean? Loving conscious music. Well, first of all, I think intention. <laughs> so I have a team on the other side. I'll just share this. So <laughs> um, with God as well. Um, and so loving conscious music is really about um, intention. So. One of the things that I've been shown and very much realize for sure is that everything, everything and anything starts with intention. And if you don't know what an intention is behind something, I used to laugh at people that would talk about this stuff because I was like, oh, I just didn't get it. But intention is 10 tenths of the law. So without intention, if you make or create or do anything, you're not really understanding actually what you're doing. And you have to understand your intention from your heart and your soul behind it. So if you're going to do something, you have to know the intention. And my intention is very clear. It's to write conscious music. I would never write, sing, or put any energy out that's negative, ever. And everything that I do comes with that intention, which is conscious. So I say it because I think I didn't have a term for what I knew I wanted to create, which was music that is conscious to help the soul feel its worth. Mm -hmm. and to have the opportunity and the support to thrive at life. So when I write music, I write conscious music from the first person to support the soul within the listener. And this is a very different thing because I don't think musicians have languaging for that. But that's actually what a good musician actually typically does. Um, and I think, you know, words have power. I know this to be very true. Thoughts have power. And what's very cool about music is what I've done. It's very cool because I wouldn't know you without my music. Mm -hmm. Truth. Um, and I also wouldn't know thousands and thousands and thousands of people. And the only people that sort of like my music are pretty much conscious people. And what's really cool about that is we start to do something that's pretty darn cool and new. And we get to have conscious conversations. And this bloom is never ending. And I guarantee you, you know, if you tap in, if you were to reach some of the people that have actually used my music, I guarantee you I've helped them. And that was the intention because it was consciously done to help their soul thrive mm -hmm. more than before they knew my music. So that's what conscious music is to me. Excellent. I just want to challenge something there, Paul. Mm -hmm. um, when you said without music, I mean, yes, we have come through obviously um, your music. But without that, we don't actually know whether we our paths would have crossed, whether we, you know, this thing called coincidence, or sure. somebody reminded me recently, coincidence. 
Mm-hmm. Our paths might have crossed, they might not, we don't know. We just don't know that's that. True. That said though, I can guarantee you where I would be if I wasn't doing music is it wouldn't have been in Spain with you. And there might have been an opportunity to cross paths another way. But I have, I have this thing where I personally feel in the divine design and I don't feel like I'm really from this earth. Let's just say this. So I wouldn't be doing anything but music. So it was meant to be at that moment. And, you know, for those that are listening that might not know this, we met in Spain, in yeah. Elche. And I was uh, invited to sing for a second time for um, essentially uh, a, cart, a heart coherent um, sort of audience, um, which are all leaders in, in sort of the new age sort of movements. Um, and they're spiritual sort of leaders, if you will. Um, so I love that you, you challenged me on it. And, you know, I love a good challenge, but I don't know. I don't think that I, I really don't know how I would have met you, but you never know. Maybe, Paul, maybe. And this might be a bit of self-flattery. It might be the ego starting to flirt with me now. But okay. maybe my grandmother's words to me when I was, uh, you know, what, nearly, nearly 60 years ago about me being a footballer or, or a musician, it could have been that, you know, we were destined to be on stage together. But hold yeah. that thought. That's another time, <laughs> another place. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. And that being said, I, it's very possible we've shared a past life together too, somewhere other than here at this moment in time too. So anything's possible. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I want to come in, Paul, if I can, around your, your new work, Seeds of Peace. Yes. And um, yeah. Tell us, tell us about the inspiration for Seeds of Peace. Yeah, sure. So um, when my father uh, died, um, what is really interesting about my life is that I, um, I basically have, I'm a psychic and I'm clairaudient, okay? So this is what I would say. So these are the two parts of me that I didn't understand before my dad died, really, truthfully, um, at all. And so what's sort of what's sort of fascinating is after my dad died, I started to have clear audience very clearly with uh, with the divine, with source, and also with other souls that are not incarnated. <laughs> and I've always had this in my life. I just sort of shut it down. Um, and you know, I've always had sort of that that inner voice telling me certain things that are very specific. Um, so one of the messages that came through to me is that I will never have peace in my life until I find peace within. Yeah. Period. This message was very clear. And I remember being very uh, confused and uncertain of how to achieve that. So I sort of, that was the message at the beginning after my dad died. And I was very lost, probably on the edge of my own suicide, if I'm really honest, because I just thought if I couldn't, if I couldn't heal, then I just couldn't do this anymore. And I remember telling God, I don't know if I can continue being alive. I just felt so broken to the point of actually just not knowing if I would ever be okay again is really the truth. And what's sort of interesting about the seeds of peace is that I've written seven albums. This is my seventh. And I knew this year at the United Nations for the third invitation I've had, it was to basically sing for the International Day of Peace on the 70th anniversary of the Declaration of Human Rights. And um, it's very interesting to me because I was singing at the UN Chapel and I remember this thing started happening within me that I knew that I would write uh, a peace project album. And I didn't really know what that looked like. And I was sort of tired and burnt out from music still at this point. So I was like, oh, I don't think I have another album in me. That was sort of how I felt. And then I went to India to meet Daddy Jenki, um, and I was invited to meet a leader that's 103 years old, and she leads the Brahma Kumari. And I, you know, my music invited me there. I was I was invited because of my music to meet her on Mount Tabu at the headquarters of the Brahma Kumari. They have 9,000 centers around the world, um, and they're very different. They use technology and the idea of um, treating people like they're angels which I sort of like that idea. And I think we're an angel once we decide to be. <laughs> so I went and I realized on Mount Abu um, that, I would, that I would do this album. And it's sort of one of the longest sort of germination 
sort of albums I've done. And while I was there, this woman that I met who uses my music in a San Diego hospital to help um, heart transplant patients that are babies, um, she uses my music in the hospital and she sort of pushed me to do this. And I, I listened. And I think what's really cool about what happens when you start following your divine design with your soul and your heart in full alignment is the world shows you what you need at times. And she, she knew I needed this push and she pushed me enough that I did it. And I wouldn't have done it without her actual pushing me, I don't think. So Seeds of Peace is really about finding the inner peace within the listener. And it's an opportunity and it opens up a question of really, I think the most important question that there is, is, you know, do you feel peaceful inside? And, you know, for me, for the first time in my life, where I thought I would never finish my music catalog, I finished my music catalog with this album. It's my seventh. And I'm at peace with music. So I know I will no longer die with my music still inside of me, like that question. Mm -hmm. And um, it's very cool because I wasn't sure if this would happen for me at 33 and 34 years old. I thought it was over. I thought my music days were maybe over. And then I had this surprise sort of experience that sort of happened. And um, this album is really a container of um, inner peace that I know is really cool because many of the people that funded it, which I think there's a huge power to that, the money that came to pay for this album was actually from my music and people that support it. So um, their energy is in it as well, their soul, their heart, mm -hmm. their spirit. And that's very peaceful um, because they're some of the best people I know on the planet. Um, so it's pretty cool. Wow. Thank you. What do you have a bucket list? Oh, so what was that? A bucket list. You have a, a bucket, bucket list. list. Yes. Well, I've been living my bucket list since uh, 2011. Um, no one is promised tomorrow on earth. So um, I sort of realized that the day my father died. Um, and the truth is, in my bucket list, I've done a lot of the things that I had visions of as a child. I just actually got back from the pyramids. I went to see uh, the pyramids. I put this album literally on the base of the, of the Great Pyramid of Giza. Um, and I've been to India. Um, the thing that I feel, you know, some of the things that I haven't done, um, I haven't been on Oprah Winfrey's show. And I say this with great humility. The only thing I really want to do that's probably of that vein right now is I really want to thank her for helping me uh, in 2011 with the OWN network and in particular her masterclass. Um, so my biggest, you know, top thing on my bucket list is to just thank her in person. And I really hope that that happens. I've sort of been putting this out there for quite a while. And I know so many people that know her intimately and personally more and more. And it's funny because I haven't had the chance yet, but that's probably my biggest bucket list one right now. Mm. Yet being the operative word. Yet. <laughs> yet. Okay. As we draw towards a close, Paul, mm. if you had one, just one, and, and I know you've got many, um, I've kind of just had this, this label, and I don't, I don't deal in labels. I've got this thing against labels, because labels are for jars, not people. Right. <laughs> I've come up with a label. I'm kind of breaking my own rule, my own rule here. And it's like, okay. oh, this guy's a musical messenger. Mm. And so on that messenger, if you had a uh, note, Paul, if you had one big message above all else to mm. deliver to the world, what would it be? Well, I think that um, the biggest message is, is really, it's really coming into focus more and more. And it's really, um, I think, to remember to stop being so hard on ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I think that most people are really, 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 in my experience, are really, really, really hard on themselves. Yeah. And I think that it's really easy to pretend that we don't do that. Uh, but I think more and more as I travel this sort of world and meet a lot of people um, and listen, I like to listen to people, I think a lot of people suffer um, and don't really share 
who they really are and they hide mm -hmm. behind masks that are very, very, very thick. So I would say the most important message is actually to realize that in your heart is where you will find the most beautiful things that exist for you. And I think if you're really honest with yourself, you have to have that conversation and say, I love myself. And until you are willing to sort of show up and maybe start to heal some of the wounds in your heart, because we've all been wounded here on earth, it's been pretty traumatic. Um, it's a human sort of trauma to be a human being. Um, and it's very hard to be a human being. And I think we need to start really being honest about the fact that we have been programmed by our conscious and our subconscious mind of the status quo of the past. And I think until we sort of stop that process and just go within ourselves to our heart and actually just love ourselves from that space forward, sort of draw the line in the sand and realize that I will make a commitment to love myself and to go from my head into my heart and to live from my heart. And when it asks something of me, to do it. Because if you don't, every single time you're adding a mask to cover yourself. And I think, you know, I've learned this process for the last eight years, but it's really easy with a mantra to become love, expanding love. All your heart does, like a compass, is it knows to love. Mm -hmm. And if you're, if you're not in that space, I love Rumi's quote. Let's just use this one. So stop, close your eyes, fall in love, and stay there. And it's really a beautiful one. Uh, so I think that's probably the big messenger, the messenger message that I would share about, I think, just what I've learned. And I think once we stop being so hard on ourselves and, and actually, in many ways, self-hatred, if you really want to call it something, I think we actually start to bloom an opportunity for a better future for us of the experiences that we can, we can have. And when you look at everything as energy, it helps us understand that there's really like those two things, the fear and the love, they're like gas pedals. Yeah. Whatever you're going to press is going to go out in an energy. So peace, love, joy, happiness, prosperity is a love-based root. And you put it out as energy. So it has to come from the inside to the outside world. And whatever you put out as energy, it's going to come back to us. Yeah. So if you're going to put out fear, which is hatred, hostility, etc., blah, 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 you're going to put that out. And I guarantee you, it will come back. So we need to become very conscious of the energy we create and become responsible creators. And when you put out love vibrationally, energetically, it does definitely create the life and the experiences that we're going to have. So I know you because I put out love. That's the truth. Yeah. If I put out hatred, I probably wouldn't know you. And I really like having this conversation. So I think that's the sort of thing that I think we need to really become clean on. So that's why you go into the heart. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Interesting contrast there, Paul. And, and a very simple one. The very fir first podcast that went out uh, was Mastering Life is a Simple as ABC. And, and, yeah. and it is because I think life is a very simple game. It we is. complicate it. Our ego steps in and creates havoc and this fear and and all that stuff. But that's another time, another place. Yep. So I want to ask. Uh, I want to ask a really, really big, another big question because that was a big question, I believe, and certainly a personal one, Paul. But I want to ask this: What does speaking from your heart mean to you? Mm. Well, I can safely say that one of one, I mean, I've had so many teachers that have taught me so many things. Um, and I think for me, there's really something so beautiful in the genius of the simplicity of life when you finally get it, is that, you know, ultimately, um, you either are a vessel of the divine or you're not. And I think until you sort of become a vessel of the good vibrations or the conscious vibrations i don't really know um, how to be anything else now and i'm not saying i'm perfect because i trip and fall on fear like you know that's what being humans about sometimes and but if i fall i get up a lot easier now because i can look in the mirror and go you know what i like myself i'm very proud of what i've done in a very humble way mm -hmm. uh, because i know that i'm no longer by myself and I can guarantee you, it's very funny. I used to be scared of family sort of um, not being in my life, you know, 
you know, I had to keep good family relationships, no matter even how bad they were to me at times, these family members and extended family. But what it's really interesting now is if anything ever happened to anyone in my life where I needed some help, I have people literally all around the world that I could call. And the only reason why I know those people that are good people, by the way, is because my heart has actually loved them. And I think, you know, from my heart, nothing comes into, into this lifetime. And I really ultimately believe in the win-win relationship. So my heart really just wishes for everyone to know that they have the right to thrive and to honor that part of you that is divine and that vessel of you, you are a vessel of love. And I think, you know, I believe that we are actually angels that sort of forgot. That's really how I feel about human beings. I think we forgot that we are angels. And I think when we start looking at that sort of idea, I think we realize that it's a choice to be good. So choose it. Choose to become the vessel of the good vibrations because that's what actually the world needs, first of all. But what's the best part about that is that you will actually see the reflection back that you have loved. And that for me is really something that I've, you know, I've taken full accountability for my heart that way. So everything that I do, I don't do anything without my heart being um, really in, in the picture or in the energy. Mm. Yeah. I think it's fair to say, Paul, that you've planted a lot of seeds of peace during this uh, podcast conversation. So, you know, certainly from my own point of view, and uh, I, I can absolutely know that this will be uh, reverberated. Uh, this energy will be reverberated through the listeners. So sincere gratitude to you. Yeah. And I have to share my shirt because I had this as a gift, but it's 100%. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Bridget I just had to, to I had quote, to show you. We're spiritual beings having a human experience. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so true. <laughs> yeah. So how can people get in touch with you, reach out to you, Paul, find out more about you? What's your contact details? Yeah, so it's really simple. So I believe in pollinating love and kindness. So I made a, my name is long. So everybody always asks, how do you say Paul Lufton, blah, blah, blah. So, but it's Paul Luftenegger. So you can go to paulluftenegger.com or look me up on Google, or you can go to a much simpler email address, which is www.bekindness.com. So B-E-E kindness.com. And um, that's where I'll be. As ever, listeners, those uh, contact details will be in the show notes. And um, yeah, I think it's time to uh, to sign off now. And I'll certainly be reflecting on this, uh, what I believe has been a beautiful conversation. And uh, I think all that remains now to be said is whatever you do, always walk your path with heart. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Paul. Lots of love to everyone listening. Thank you. Perfect.